Lyme disease comes with a myriad of symptoms and signs, and it can be really confusing and daunting just to get a diagnosis and treatment. On this Looking at Lyme podcast, we're heading to Rhinebeck, New York, adjacent to the Hudson River, and we're going to meet a doctor who developed an integrative approach to medicine. Dr. Kenneth Bach has accumulated over 35 years of experience diagnosing the root cause of chronic illnesses like Lyme. He founded Bach Integrative Medicine in response to the increasing need for medical providers who take a unique whole-body approach to diagnosing and treating Lyme and other diseases. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Bach. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Sarah. How did you first get involved in treating patients with Lyme disease and co-infections? Oh, it dates back. I mean, my first patient with Lyme disease, uh, I can remember it. It dates back to 1985. Um, And I remember it very well because it was a patient with a swollen red toe, the end of the toe. And I thought, oh, this this looks like an allergic reaction. I gave them Benadryl and it didn't get better. And it was getting more swollen. I was, and I, I didn't really know what it was. It was kind of strange. And so I did some research. This is what I do if I get things that I really don't, you know, don't know. And I ran into research about Lyme. And, and it was because I asked him questions. And he said he had just come from a vacation on Block Island, which turns out is endemic for Lyme disease, as probably many people know. And so the, uh, when I did the research, I realized, wow. Uh, there's a lot, there's this Lyme disease on Block Island and it comes from deers, et cetera, et cetera, and the ticks. And um, I treated him with, at that time, three weeks of doxy, which I would treat more now. I treat probably at least four, if not six weeks, at least. But, um, and he got better. And it turns out it was indeed Lyme disease. And that was my first case in 1985. And that uh, it's just one of those things where for me, it seems like I've always been interested in uh, difficult complex cases. I, it's kind of makes me be a medical detective and I really enjoy that. And, uh, you know, the whole uh, analysis and breaking things down and then the synthesis, putting it back together. And um, so that started it. I mean, I, uh, my office is in D- Dutchess County, which is endemic for Lyme. But, you know, that was pretty early on, 85. And then so that was when I started. Once the, the awareness is the key because so many people miss it, especially way back then. So that was that was my first foray into Lyme disease. Yeah, I like that concept of being a medical detective and really like listening to your patients and having that curiosity uh, to try to solve that. Yeah, I mean, the key, you know, and I always say, I mean, the first book I ever wrote was 1997 called The Road to Immunity, How to Survive and Thrive in a Toxic World. And in that book, uh, I, I say, if you don't look, you won't see. And if you don't listen, you won't hear. And so part of the key about being a medical detective is just really that, looking and listening. And I I learned in medical school way back, I was, one of my mentors was this uh, Dr. George Engel, who was the father of uh, psychosocial biological medicine. And uh, we had a terrific um, uh, medicine psychiatric liaison team. So I was well trained in that, and, and and Dr. Engel and I and I talk about him in my latest book. He was he was really a mentor to me, and he taught us the whole thing about the open ended interview and really listening, and that that's where you really solve your cases. And I think that's really true. Most of our, you know, I have an hour and a half with new patients. I listen to their stories, and some of them actually. That's why I have tissues on my desk for them. They they break down and cry and say, "God, you're the first person that ever really listened to me," or you know, or or, or this fact or that fact, and. I think that's the key, and I really enjoy it. It's part of who I am, and it's really helped to make me a, a, you know, kind of good at trying to figure out tough, complex cases. Well, I do know how important it is to have that doctor in your life who really does take the time to listen, and and I know some people listening to this podcast are still looking to find those doctors. <laughs> and so you mentioned uh, that Lyme disease is a lot more prevalent in your county now, and you're you're located around the Hudson Valley, correct? Yeah, right. We're in the mid Hudson Valley, about two hours north of New York City, just not that far from. I mean, I cross because I live in Woodstock, which is a little more to the west. So I cross over the Hudson River every day, twice, going back and forth to work. And I 
I just love it. It's just, it's just gorgeous, and it's just a beautiful place to live. It is beautiful. I remember coming down there for a Pete Seeger concert a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> the clear water. I'm the, the clear water, right? Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Uh, okay, back to the interview. So what is integrative medicine? So integrative medicine um, is it's a practice of medicine that really emphasizes uh, – seeking underlying root causes of uh, it's really really aimed for chronic i feel like chronic complex disease obviously can it treat acute disease as well but you know things like uh, other specialties you have a fracture you want to go see an orthopedist etc but integrative medicine i'll start out what it's not it, it's not just uh, a smorgasbord of take a little bit of a and a little bit from b in other words like in a, in a surgery, you take a little acupuncture, maybe a little massage therapy. That it's it's much more a mindset. It's a mindset that looks at symptoms and looks at medical problems and tries to not just put band aids on them, but actually figure out what's really going on. As one of my friends and patients said, and I say this to a lot of my new patients, is it's really like uh, looking under the hood and figuring out what's going on with each person. So it really is a mindset that utilizes a much larger armamentarium or toolbox than I had in my conventional medicine training. I had very good, uh, very conservative conventional medicine training at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. It was an excellent medical school. And as I said, I got really great kind of medical psychiatric. And so it really kind of helped me in this path that I'm in now in terms of, but uh, I think the integrative medicine aspect is not only limiting, limiting yourself to medicines and surgery, but it's also using other things, dietary modifications, uh, nutritional supplements, whether they be nutraceuticals or herbals, sometimes some combination homeopathics, and and also integrating, you know, I mean, I will prefer to, you know, get an acupuncturist involved or have people seek massage therapy or uh, things like that. So it's not like that, that doesn't, doesn't need to be part of some treatments, but it's really the medical mindset that I speak of when I say of integrative medicine. Can you describe how the whole body approach works for Lyme patients? Well, you know, for Lyme disease, uh, as many listeners probably know, if, they, if they've had it or know somebody with it, uh, can affect multiple systems, uh, multiple organs. In fact, when I see patients, complex patients with these multitude of symptoms, who on, on the outside, if you heard somebody like that when I was in training, they'd say, oh, give the person Valium. You know, they got a symptom from every every single place on the body. Oh, it's anxiety, give them Valium. But the reality is Lyme disease can affect so many different organ systems. You know, the, 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 the four major ones, of course, would be the, you know, the skin where you get the rash, the heart where you can get palpitations or a heart block, uh, the joints, and of course, the neuro- that's the musculoskeletal, and the uh, the brain and the neurologic where you can get either central nervous system uh, symptoms peripheral nervous system, you know, either numbness or tingling, or uh, we call dysesthesias, which can be burning. Uh, and of course, cognitive dysfunction and all kinds of, you know, word finding difficulties and all kinds of uh, neuropsych symptoms. And in, 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 so that's why it really requires this whole person, whole body approach, because you, it's, it's not just simplistic, give an antibiotic and they're better. I mean, they need antibiotics, don't get me wrong. But, you know, one of the things that we do in an integrative approach to Lyme, especially the the more complex or later stage Lyme, the, um, is we always like to protect people when we use antibiotics. So we give them probiotics and uh, prebiotics or, or we call cobiotics even, where it may be uh, probiotic bacteria, probiotic uh, uh, yeast type things like Saccharomyces boulardii, which can prevent antibiotic-induced diarrhea, prebiotics to help um, uh, promote the good bacteria. And then we do some liver protective uh, nutrients and herbs uh, like uh, milk thistle and NAC or uh, ALA. Um, we have certain combination formulas we use. So we want to protect and then uh, the body, you know, from possible side effects of the antibiotics. And then we also may use with the antibiotics or sometimes by themselves or after antibiotics, various herbal combinations. And there have been some, you know, studies on some of the herbs coming out of uh, John Hopkins and things that 
uh, may be helpful in both Lyme disease and a more recent one came out in terms of uh, uh, Babesia, one of the co-infections. So um, these disorders, both Lyme and, and the various co-infections, Babesia, Bartonella, or Lichianoplasma, uh, to name the basics, and then there are a lot of others that we look for as well. But um, they can just masquerade as so many things. And that's why you need this, quote, whole body or whole person approach. They, they, can, look, uh, they can look like dementia. They can look like Parkinson's. They, they can look like rheum, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or other kinds of arthritis. Um, so it can, it can have an appearance, look like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. So um, uh, it's important not to just buttonhole it. And that's the one thing about integrative medicine, I think. It, it, it's, you know, the whole idea of specialized medicine that but we're in nowadays and we have been in for, you know, you know, years and years since Descartes kind of got into this thing of breaking down the human body. It's very important. Obviously I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use a GI guy to do a scope. I need to see if there's esophagitis or colitis. And, you know, I certainly will use a, a neurologist and you may need, may need an EMG and nerve conduction or what have you. So, you know, I, I get specialists whenever I need them involved for the complex, for sure. But the problem is, you need somebody to tie it all together and not just treat one part. You know, there's a classic uh, slide I have when I lecture of this elephant and all these doctors in white coats at various parts of the elephant. One's got the ear and says, wow, it's a huge fan. And the other's got the trunk. Oh, it's a huge this. And the other's got the tail, which is much thinner, which is little whip. Another guy's got the huge foot, which is huge and says, it's this. And the reality is nobody's saying it's an elephant because they're each so focused on their little aspects. And that's where, again, integrative medicine comes into play, really being able to see the whole picture, dive deep. So it is both analysis and breaking things down and figuring it out. And then, of course, synthesis of putting it all together. And that's the key. And I think that's the part we may lose when we just have our one our little aspect of specialized medicine and we just see that and nothing else. Absolutely. What is chelation therapy and how do EDTA IVs help to improve uh, blood flow? I don't think it's related to Lyme disease, but chelation therapy, yeah, is used for heavy metals. That's what that's where really chelation came from, is chelating out like a, a claw, or grab on, latch onto heavy metals and bringing out in the body when people have heavy metal burdens or toxicity. Um, what you're describing is chelation therapy used for uh, vascular disease. And, you know, it's been used... Uh, I think, you know, it dates back to probably, uh, I think, 1975 or um, somewhere in between 1970 and 1975. Um, actually, it dates back to the 50s when they when they realized that there were certain things going on with people in the automobile industry and they had lead toxicity and that some of their vascular complaints were actually related to heavy metals. And they did this chelation and the vascular complaints got better. That was the beginning of this whole thing. But um, so it's evolved over the years not just on like lead toxicity or specific toxicity, but as a generalized treatment to treat uh, vascular disease. And, um, you know, it, there's a number of mechanisms that it, it, that it, it works by. I would say that the, the, the latest studies, the, the, the largest study was done with approximately 2,000 patients um, a, a few years ago. Um, and um, it, uh, Dr. Gervasio from uh, I think it's Mount Sinai in, in, in Miami, and he, he led the study. But you know, uh, I, it was many. I was a participant, and there was many of us that actually were contributors in the study. Many sites in the study, in, uh, investigators, um, where you, you actually did uh, you did chelation, and basically um, it was uh, blinded, and it showed an improvement in. Uh, they were looking at uh, heart attacks. Uh, and strokes as, you know, uh, outcomes, and if you could have less of them. And it turns out it was uh, quite effective, especially in people with diabetes. So that study is now being, uh, the next phase of that study is being pursued, especially in people with diabetes, because the results were so, uh, so dramatic that if it was a medicine and not chelation, chelation is very controversial in the medical world, unfortunately, but if it was not a, if it was a, um, as a drug, it probably would have been all over the front pages, but because it was chelation, didn't get that kind of positive press. But they are moving forward uh, uh, with it was a very expensive study, millions of dollars, and 
it was it was quite positive. So, um, you know, the problem is it's not accepted in uh, in, in in conventional medicine. Um, you know, I, to me, it doesn't obviate the need that people may need a stent or they may need a bypass when they're really really bad, especially if they have severe carotid disease. Let's say the nice thing about chelation is it it affects the the the, the body and the circulation throughout the whole body. So. Well, I'm glad and, I asked you that question because I was aware of how it was used for chelating heavy metals, but I wasn't aware of uh, its relation to vascular health. Yeah, I mean, that's really, it's a different kind. That's using disodium magnesium EDTA. For heavy metals, we usually use calcium EDTA. Mm. You have to be very careful with the disodium magnesium EDTA. You have to do it very slowly because if you do it too quick, you can really cause an arrhythmia. But the calcium EDTA, we always do it very slowly because it's it, that's what needs to be done. Um, and and safely, and you watch kidney function. You know, there's listen. There's potential side effects of everything. You have to watch kidney function. You have to make sure they're hydrated, and you may have to make sure they take their good minerals because it chelates some of the good, like zinc, mm. uh, as as opposed just to the heavy metals. But you're not only doing it for if you're doing it for vascular disease, you're not only doing it for heavy metals. You're doing it for the effects it has on the vasculature. And how does Lyme relate to brain inflammation? Well. And that's a very good question. And in fact, you know, it's probably, uh, it, you know, uh, I just probably had a recent book released called Brain Inflamed, all about brain inflammation. And, and there's a whole, one of the longest chapters <laughs> is on Lyme disease and co-infections, especially Bartonella. But, um, you know, Lyme affects the central nervous system. So you can, you know, it's one of the neurological, you know, major complications of chronic Lyme is this whole kind of a, chronic encephalopathy, we call it a subtle encephalopathy, where you may have decreased memory, forgetting, especially word finding difficulties that, you know, you're actually trying to say something, you just can't find the word, pretty classic. Um, But so that can be Lyme disease itself, or, you know, what happens is the infections set off this whole um, reaction, and I'm giving a a lecture at a conference tomorrow uh, to a few hundred doctors, um, and I'm talking about brain inflammation. And the process of the infections, a lot of things that can uh, create systemic inf- uh, inflammation, including stress, in addition to infections and uh, toxicants, and uh, you know, for uh, brain trauma can can it can actually cause inflammation. But the Lyme itself can set in this process of inflammation. Inflammation systemically gets up to the blood-brain barrier, which is a very important uh, cellular dynamic cellular interface that separates. The outside of us, you know, the periphery from the from the brain keeps toxicants out, and also has an uh, uh, ability to let good things in and good things out of the brain. Uh, I'm not good things waste out of the brain. Good nutrients into the brain waste out, but that can get inflamed as well. It gets leaky, just like people have heard about a leaky gut, and you can let inflammatory mediators in, which have been upregulated by the infection, and those inflammatory mediators. They up, upregulate what's called the microglia. The microglia are the immune cells in the central nervous system. And they start <clears throat> spitting out all kinds of inflammatory mediators. And you get this feed forward cycle of inflammation, inflammation, and uh, ultimately the supporting cells, the, the microglia and the astrocytes in the nervous system, when they're upregulated and putting out all these inflammatory mediators, they have this negative impact on the neurons. And so then the neurons break down, the neurons don't function as well, it affects the synapses and the the transmission of uh, information and impulses, and also it allows for autoimmunity to set in. So that's the even next, the more complex thing is what's infection, what's inflammation, and what's ultimately autoimmunity related to infection. And so that's what gets so complex with all these things. And so uh, the whole idea of brain inflamed is to let people know that you know, Lyme and Bartonella, among things like post-strep and mycoplasma and other things, in addition to many other things that are not infectious, can actually cause brain in, uh, brain inflammation. And there are ways to quiet that down. And that's, you know, it's very important because you can treat the bacteria, the Lyme disease bacteria, or the co-infection. And some of the drugs like minocycline or doxycycline are very anti-inflammatory. Azithromycin is anti-inflammatory. So some of these antibiotics actually have, in addition to antibacterial properties, anti-inflammatory properties as well. Yeah, I think it's really important for people to be aware of those symptoms, though, because sometimes 
you know, when you first get sick, you are neural compromised, but you're not even really aware of it. You just know you're not feeling well. Whereas people who know you as your regular normal can tell that there's a difference in how you're functioning. <laughs> totally. Exactly. And sometimes that's what it takes somebody else to notice it, actually, you know. I just wanted to ask you, I know you wrote a section in there about allergies and sensitivities. Could you comment on that? Well, certainly. I mean, there's <clears throat> the book is broken down each chapter, but after the introduction and after the there's a whole chapter on the immune system, which I'm, uh, you know, I'm very proud of because I really spent a long time trying to be able to make it comprehensible to the layperson. This is written for parents, uh, mental health providers, and teachers and educators. So this is, I mean, doctors will read it too. I'm lecturing to, doc- to doctors and practitioners tomorrow, but you know, it's really made so that a layperson can understand it. And the immune system is so complex. And then there's a, a, a chapter on the microbiome, <clears throat> and then each chapter is about something that could, that could contribute to or cause uh, brain inflammation and, and, and brain inflammation. And allergies and sensitivities are one of those things. Allergies, the allergies are uh, classically immunologically mediated IgE allergies. That's the classic allergies, and including food allergies. So if you have a, you know, like an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts or you get hives from strawberries or you know, a runny nose from something, and it turns out that's an IgE. That's an allergy. But then there are sensitivities to foods that are not classically allergic in terms of mediated by IgE, which is an IgE is one of the immune uh, globulins. It's an immune, uh, there's IgG, IgM, IgA, and IgE. They're different immune proteins, immune globulins, fairly large molecules. So the sensitivities are not mediated by IgE. They may be mediated by IgG. There may be some types of cellular mediators that mediate that. And um, so such as like a gluten sensitivity or dairy sensitivity or any other kind of food, you can be sensitive to a food and not allergic to it. And it's easy to miss that. And so there's a lot of times when when people are very inflamed, especially with brain inflammation or systemic inflammation, uh, we'll test for gluten, we'll test for allergies, we'll test for gluten, celiac, gluten sensitivity. Um, but there are times when those come up negative and we may even test for uh, genetic predisposition to celiac, which if, if it's positive, even if you're not celiac, that would be more of a, a, a clue to, to go gluten-free. But we may be clinically just on an empiric basis, put uh, people on a gluten-free and dairy-free diet, making sure they get obviously calcium, magnesium, and they're dairy-free. But uh, because uh, those foods can be inflammatory, and so we're looking to decrease inflammation in any way that we can. Obviously, if there's an infection, if you kill the infection, you're killing the cause of some of that in- inflammation. But but also, I have you know people let's say who might have uh, allergies, let's say uh, ragweed in the fall, or you know trees of grass in the spring, and during that season they can't have eggs because that's when they react to eggs because. Allergies are additive and they're all inflammatory. So this whole integrative medicine approach is to try to take away all the things, as much as we can, of course, that could contribute to inflammation. So it's not just giving an antibiotic and killing the bacteria, the Lyme or the co-infection. It's also trying recognizing that there are many other factors that may contribute to inflammation. And certainly the gut is is huge in every chronic in every chronic case. And so we always look at the gut and try to help the gut with the right uh, probiotics to help, to help the microbiome. And, um, and, and of course, when you, when you help the gut and you, and you can heal what we call a leaky gut, which is the same thing as that blood brain barrier, it lets inflammatory mediators outside the gut into the circulation, getting around and then eventually getting even up to the brain and the blood brain barrier. You, you want to do whatever you can to decrease inflammation. And you have to be very cognizant that certainly allergies and sensitivities can contribute to inflammation. Are you seeing similarities in the way that the body responds to Lyme, which is a, a bacterial infection caused by Borrelia bacteria, and COVID, which is a viral infection? Well, yes, uh, in the sense uh, that um, COVID is very inflammatory. In fact, that's, uh, you know, that's, Really, you get the viral infection at first, 
but it's the in, in, the in really exaggerated inflammatory response that really makes people sick and, and, and ultimately can kill people. So yes, inflammation, that's why I wrote the book, Brain. inflammation is really, really harmful. And COVID causes a huge amount of inflammation. And, and in, a, in a Lyme patient who's already inflamed, it's going to make them much sicker. And if you can imagine, number one, that the immune system has now got to direct a lot of its resources to deal with the COVID, so it can't deal with the Lyme as much. But also, um, it's the additive effects of inflammation. Yes, de- de- definitely. And right now... Uh, it's a tough time, even in terms of stress, because stress, I have some really good slides and papers that show how stress really creates inflammation um, and contributes to it, both in the gut and uh, and affecting the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. And um, and now with, you know, in terms of teens, let's say adolescents and teens who are stressed to the gills anyway with all their social media pressures and the pressures to perform in school and the FOMO and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and the cyberbullying and the bullying, um, uh, that now you add on to that, the pandemic-related uh, loneliness and isolation. And you just, you know, I have this image uh, of this cauldron, boy, you know, bubbling over, because that's what we're creating in our kids, unfortunately, and, and not just kids, adults. I mean, I see, you know, families every day, and this whole year has been really difficult. You can imagine, you know, for all of us, but I just imagine somebody in in New York, a a couple with a four-year-old and a two-year-old who are confined to a New York City apartment or, you know, and and it's it's, it's very difficult. And then, of course, teenagers just think about teenagers who their whole thing is about friends and they can't see their friends and they're with their parents. Oh, my God. You know, day in and day out. And um, and then adults who really, you know, I mean, you know, from my point of view, I mean, when you can't hug your friends. You know, luckily you can still hug your wife and kids if they're in your pod and everything, hopefully, of course. But, you know, you have, you know, hopefully you have close friends that you like to, you know, hang out with and and, and hug. And, and it's a year for people who haven't hugged uh, another person. So the, this has been very stressful. And all that stress contributes to inflammation. And by the way, just so we make it clear to all the listeners, you know, I was on another podcast and I asked somebody this and they said, you're testing me. I asked them, what are the two main uh, things to help the immune system to kind of nourish the immune system, and everybody, of course, would think, "Oh, vitamin D, prebiotics, vitamin D, yeah, prebiotics, <laughs> probiotics, zinc." And I say, "Yeah, those are all great. Love and laughter." Oh, I like yeah. it. And so we just I always say we just nourished uh, our immune system with a nice little laugh we had there. So that was <laughs> that's <laughs> perfect. But, um, but you know, in addition to to the book, there is a a, a website. That, I, uh, that actually uh, my son created called uh, braininflamed.com. And that's inflamed with the D.com, all small letters. And on there, there, you know, there are some resources. One of them actually is, um, and there is some actually uh, connection to some of the podcasts I've done and people think, think I've really enjoyed them. But um, uh, there is, I, I made this template for, it's called, I, I you know, I worked with autism spectrum disorders. I still do. And I've worked with them for many years. Uh, and they're a spectrum. And in dealing with the, the brain inflamed and all the neuropsych complaints and, you know, anxiety, depression, OCD, panic attacks, you know, severe mood swings, you know, aggression, psychosis, all these things. I realized that I, I came up with this thing called the mood dysregulation spectrum. And it's, it kind of puts all these things on a spectrum from the let you know the more milder symptoms to the more intense, and actually it has a way. There's a there's a template, a blank template that people could download, and actually fill out themselves for themselves or their or their adolescents and teens, and use it as they, you know, in the book I give a lot of uh, questions and clues after each chapter that that the, the readers can have to not to make a diagnosis. I'm not asking them to make. Uh, you know, physician uh, diagnoses, but to give them perhaps paths or avenues to pursue that what may be involved in their child, you know. And so uh, I think there are a lot of helpful, you know, things that might lead you to hypothyroidism or it might lead you to maybe Lyme disease, you know, um, you know, where you live, where you vacation, 
any tick bites or rashes, you know, does your kid, you know, you know, play soccer and go in the woods? Are you a family that goes camping and hikes? All those kind of things. Um, but um, uh, so they can actually download this template and then maybe follow it every month and uh, as they do different things and see how the, the symptoms vary. And they can also compare theirs or their child's template with some templates that I've put together. And they're not obviously definitive because they're variations, but I put together some representative tam- templates for each thing, like for every d- disorder I'm talking about that may contribute for Lyme and co-infections, for this uh, uh, post-infection autoimmunity, uh, sometimes referred to as PANS or PANDAS. And I, I actually also call it TABI, infection triggered autoimmune brain inflammation, which again relates very much to what we were just saying before about Lyme and inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's one for thyroid and adrenal and metabolic and toxicants, that kind of stuff. So, and allergies and sensitivities. So, each one of the chapters actually has questions and clues and then a template. And so hopefully that site can be helpful for people. So when you ask for a better resource, you know, all kidding aside, that's that's a very, that's a, that's a good resource. Oh, well, that's and great. Also, I, I like that there's, you know, then you've got a baseline to compare how things change over time as well. Totally. Yes, exactly. And, you know, if they need more in terms of resources, really, uh, you know, BachIntegrative.com and that's integrative, I-V-E. And, you know, if anybody ever needs any, you know, high, you know, we do use nutritional supplements, pharmaceutical grade supplements, and there is a BachNutritionals.com where, you know, very high grade uh, supplements that we use in terms of with the, the Lyme patients to protect uh, them and some of those herbs that we use. So um, there are various resources. So those, those are, I think those could be very helpful for people very helpful. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us, Dr. Bach, and stay well and enjoy the summer on the Hudson River. You too. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you, Sarah. Pleasure. That was Dr. Kenneth Bach, who takes a unique whole body approach to Lyme. It was really interesting to hear about his mindset of being a medical detective. That's another podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Cormode. Have a fabulous spring out there, everyone, and stay safe in the outdoors. Outdoors.